Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the National Press Club here in Washington, D.C. As my glasses are fogging, it's a little humid here in D.C. for those of, of you who are not uh, as, as, yes, sir, as forecast. <laughs> so thank you both to the reporters in the room for, and those who are joining us virtually for today's announcement regarding NOAA's 2024 hurricane season outlook. I'm Lori Arguelles, and I'm the Director of Strategic Communications and Partnerships for NOAA, and I'm happy to serve today as your MC, along with my colleague Erica Groche, who is the media contact for today's event, and you will be hearing her voice as she fields questions from the phone or from online a little bit later on. Um, the news release and graphics related to today's announcement will be available on NOAA.gov shortly. And for those of you who are joining us online, this news conference is being recorded, so if you do not wish to be recorded, please disconnect at this time. Uh, we have about 15 minutes worth of remarks from our speakers, followed by a question and answer session with reporters. We'll go to those in the room first, so be prepared. Um, and our speakers today are NOAA Administrator uh, Rick Spinrad, who is also the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere. Uh, our National Weather Service Director Ken Graham is here, and FEMA Deputy Administrator Eric Hooks is joining us as well. And we have Matthew Rosencrantz, who is the lead hurricane seasonal outlook forecaster here in the room for us as well. Um, it is an honor to introduce the boss. He has held senior leadership positions across NOAA, including as NOAA's chief scientist and as the assistant administrator of the National Ocean Service and our research uh, office as well. With that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rick Spinrad. Thank you, Lori. And good morning to everyone. Uh, let's get right into it, and I'll start by saying that during uh, previous outlooks that we've done, I have mentioned prior notable hurricanes as a benchmark of sorts, but as we look ahead, I think it's important to point out that past is, of course, not necessarily prologue when it comes to the hurricanes of the future. This season is looking to be an extraordinary one in a number of ways, based on our data and models with the El Nino La Nina playing out a, sig a significant role. Uh, the key this year, as in any year, is to get prepared and stay prepared. We're going to be emphasizing that throughout these comments. It's the best way to reduce risk, especially the risk of potential loss of life. Our fore forecasters now are better equipped than ever, especially thanks to critical investments from the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. President Biden's Investing in America agenda has actually allowed us to enable rapid deployment of things like advanced water models, allowed us to build near real-time, high-resolution flood inundation maps across the country, and we've also begun our path toward next-generation radar. These investments are critical. We know communities can be devastated from the impacts of hurricanes, the associated wind, storm surge, and flooding produce damage that affects local economies, affects livelihoods for years after the storm has passed. Last season, even with most Atlantic tropical activity remaining offshore from the United States, tropical cyclones caused approximately $4 billion in damages for the contigu contiguous U.S. And in the impacts of Hurricane Hillary uh, added in in the western U.S., that number rises to nearly $5 billion. The Department of Commerce and Co uh, NOAA continue to work with partners to prepare for future storms and respond to the economic impacts inflicted on communities so that they can recover more quickly in the aftermath of the storm. 
With the official start of the Atlantic hurricane season beginning next weekend, NOAA is prepared to support our nation today with the most accurate and reliable information and environmental intelligence for the official government outlook. We will continue throughout the season to provide you with the official warnings and watches, of course, and our preparation for the season represents a whole of NOAA approach. I'd like to say just a word about what that whole of NOAA approach means. We recognize all of NOAA's six line offices play a critical role during, ahead of, and after a hurricane or tropical storm has impacted the United States. You'll hear shortly from Ken Graham, the head of the National Weather Service, on his office's preparation for the season ahead. I'd like to take just a moment to recognize NOAA's other investments and advancements related to hurricanes in all of our line offices. Our research line office, the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, is going to put into operation this season the sixth version of the modular ocean model, or MOM6, as we call it. When we couple that with the hurricane analysis and forecast system, or HAFS, as we call it, which began running within the unified forecast system framework last year, MOM6 is going to improve representation of the key role that the ocean plays in driving hurricane intensity. Something I can tell you as a card-carrying oceanographer warms my heart. I would add that this is just one example of OAR's research and modeling efforts. However, to have good modeling, we've got to have reliable and accessible data. So NOAA's National Environmental Satellite Data and Information System, NESDIS, has end-to-end -end responsibility for developing much of the critical data that we need to produce the forecasts. Next month, the satellite Goes U is scheduled to launch, which will provide atmospheric and oceanic data critical to our efforts to forecast tropical activity. NOAA's National Ocean Service supports and strengthens preparedness, response, and recovery efforts to improve community resiliency. NOS provides those critical coastal survey overflights, which allow us to reopen harbors and ports and ultimately revive economies with great speed and efficiency. Our Office of Marine and Aviation Operations plays a critical role in obtaining data from storms while they are over the ocean. In particular, our Hurricane Hunter aircraft provide one of the only means for, data direct, for collecting data directly inside the storm. It's these data that provide the most improved outputs from our forecast models and, in fact, Hurricane Hunter aircraft data were critical to observing the rapid intensification that we saw of Hurricane Otis in the eastern Pacific last season, which, as you'll recall, made landfall as a devastating Cat 5 hurricane near Acapulco. OMAO, Marine and Aviation Operations, will continue to fly our P3 Hurricane Hunter aircraft into storms for as long as we can. While also we are continuing efforts to secure critical funding that's necessary to replace our aging current fleet with updated planes. And NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service is critical in the recovery efforts of a sto after storms past, including things like assessment of reefs and the, and the conduct of coral rescue and stabilization. These are key efforts to help marine environments and local economies recover. Let me just say a quick word about our partnerships, too. That was my run-through on the internal, the introspective aspect. But preparing for and responding to hurricanes requires that we at NOAA work closely with our partners in the federal government, the private sector, state governments, local jurisdictions, and, of course, NGOs and academia. And I'm delighted today to be joined by the FEMA Deputy Administrator, Eric Hooks, who will have an opportunity to share with you some of uh, the perspectives from FEMA in just a few moments. Our two agencies, NOAA and FEMA, work very well together. We've got NOAA liaisons at FEMA National Headquarters. FEMA has liaisons presently at several weather service centers, including the National Hurricane Center in Miami. We value our partnership with the U.S. Navy to help fill critical observational gaps, for example, for example by providing uh, gliders. Navy gliders provide critical data, important in improving our forecast models with inputs from data sparse areas and at times where it's hard to collect the kind of data that we need as we see hurricanes growing and strengthening. Last year, the U.S. Air Force flew a total of 93 missions with their C-130Js during the hurricane season, providing extremely valuable information from within storms coupled with our own P-3 flights. 
We also work closely with many other nations, including operating Hurricane Hunter aircraft, our own Hurricane Hunter aircraft from Barbados and Curaçao. This enables us to safely reach and operate within locations, including the far eastern Caribbean, uh, areas that would otherwise be unreachable. These are just a few examples of the crucial partnerships NOAA values as we head into the 2024 hurricane season. So where do we stand today? NOAA's Climate Prediction Center issues El Nino, Southern Oscillation, or ENSO as we call it, forecasts and discussions. The official CPC forecast issued just this month indicates a 77% chance of La Nina forming during the August-October time frame. We know the development of La Nina can lead to weaker easterly trade winds and below average vertical wind shear in the tropical Atlantic Ocean. This type of environment can be more conducive for tropical cyclone development. Also, NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information has reported record warm water temperatures for much of the tropical Atlantic Ocean, as you see here. Forecast modeling indicates that above average sea surface temperatures are predicted during the peak months of the Atlantic hurricane season from August to October. We know warm sea surface temperatures are an important factor in rapid intensification of tropical cyclones to major hurricane status, and that major hurricanes contribute significantly to the measurement of ACE, the accumulated cyclone energy, ACE. In past years, when we've seen high ACE numbers, those have historically been the years with the most destructive hurricanes, and this season, NOAA is forecasting the second highest ACE for our May outlook. So without further ado, let's dive into the numbers for this year's Atlantic hurricane season outlook. NOAA is predicting an above average 2024 Atlantic hurricane season. Specifically, there's an 85% chance of an above normal season, a 10% chance of a near normal season, and a 5% chance of a below normal season. For the range of storms expected, NOAA calls for the following. 15, 17 to 25 named storms with a top sustained wind of at least 39 miles per hour. Of these, 8 to 13 are forecast to become hurricanes with maximum sustained winds of at least 74 miles per hour. And 4 to 7 are forecast to become major hurricanes, that is category 3 to 5, with maximum sustained winds of at least 111 miles per hour. Of note, the forecast for named storms, hurricanes, and major hurricanes is the highest NOAA has ever issued for the May outlook. In addition, ACE projections range from 150% to 245%, which as I previously noticed, is the second highest ACE forecast to start a season, only behind 2010. With all of that said, I'd like to take a moment to remind you now is the time to prepare and stay prepared. Remember, it only takes one storm to devastate a community. And it's prudent to prepare now because once the storm is headed your way, it all happens so rapidly, you won't have the time to plan and prepare at that point. Before I close, I'd also like to give a special thanks to the very skilled and de dedicated forecasters at the National Hurricane Center in Miami, who work around the clock to deliver timely and accurate forecasts each and every hurricane season, as well as the hurricane hunters who fly hundreds of hours each hurricane season to support critical hurricane forecasting and research. I've done uh, six penetrations of a hurricane in a P3, and I can tell you my heart goes out to that team of uh, brave uh, aviators and the numerous members, of course, of the emergency management community who are so critical to protecting lives and property. The experts at the Climate Prediction Center who develop seasonal outlooks, including the hurricane season outlook, who, are, who use a number of tools to help decision makers, emergency managers, and the public when preparing for the season ahead. And finally, the dedicated forecasters throughout the National Weather Service who work around the clock, 24-7, 365, in every single U.S. community to provide weather forecasts and warnings upon which every person in the nation depends. The dedication of these public servants quite literally saves lives, safeguards our communities, 
and businesses. We need this entire team of top skilled experts to produce the NOAA seasonal outlook, which is the official outlook for the federal government. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the head of the National Weather Service, the director, Ken Graham. Ken, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Spinrad. I appreciate um, everybody being here. And everybody took that in, right? Those, those numbers? I mean, uh, that's the, the highest forecast that we've had. So all the ingredients are definitely in place to have an active season. Um, and, it, and it, you know, it's reason to be concerned, of course, but not alarmed, OK? So let, we need to use this time to, to our advantage to, to really be prepared uh, for the hurricane season. And, and if you think about a hurricane threatening, um, definitely got to take the time to plan and, and be ready for it. You know, once it's headed your way, it becomes really stressful and you need to be ready way ahead of time, and especially under short notice. And I want to call out somebody. I want to thank Matt Rosencrantz right there at the end of the table. Um, you know, there's a lot of computers that crunch this stuff, and, you know, we work across all the line offices to come up with these, the numbers that, that you've seen, uh, but uh, Matt leads that effort. So Matt goes through this. He, he really looks at um, everything and those, you know, he comes up with the final numbers. So I give you a big old shout out for your leadership and, and making sure we have this thing. <laughs> you don't always get to see the folks behind the scenes, but they don't, nothing runs without um, people like Matt. So thank you very much. You know, all these fancy numbers and stuff, there's a human behind this stuff. So appreciate it. So you heard the seasonal forecast for 2024 and it's expected to, to be busy. And, and a couple reminders, you know, you look at these numbers and you, you've heard, I've seen a lot of familiar faces. You've heard me thousands of times say some of these stats, but we need your help. We need you to help us communicate what the real impacts are. So we need the folks in the media, emergency management, uh, across FEMA and the emergency managers to really remind people what the actual impacts are. And it's important to, to keep talking about these every season. So busy or not, it only takes one storm to make landfall or one to even get close to you to be a busy season, right? So there could be a, many storms like we're predicting, but it's that, that one that reaches you and, and that could be a, a busy season. So we never I need everybody to be completely prepared. And I think it's important to remember it's about the impacts, not the category. And everyone's heard me say that a lot. The Saffir Simpson scale measures the wind, right? But it's, it's actually those, those other impacts. It's the water. Please help us communicate the dangers of water. This is a very critical thing. I've, I've 30 years been saying this, and, and we're making, uh, making headway on this, but we need you to every single year remind people. And we looked at 2013 to 2023 to really reevaluate some of the numbers of where we see the most fatalities. 90% of fatalities result from water. And if anybody wants to make the bumper sticker, I'll start putting them on cars across this country. 90% of fatalities occur from the water, okay? Most of those are fresh water. Uh, from, from heavy rain, rainfall, 57%. And if you take the, the fresh water, you take half of those, those are in automobiles. It's preventable. Okay, so turn around, don't drown. We need to keep spreading the word uh, about those and, and how people lose their lives in these storms. Uh, 41 storm surge fatalities took place in Hurricane Ian, and that's a reminder of, of the great loss of life that we can get uh, from these big storms and storm surge. Historically, and you remember for a long time we talked about storm surge causing the most fatalities. We've talked about that. We worked really hard to really get the word out on storm surge. In fact, we actually have a special warning um, out for storm surge separating the storm surge warning from the actual wind warning. And we've actually reduced fatalities from storm surge because we were allowing officials to evacuate vulnerable areas earlier. The threat's still there, but we're actually making a, a dent in this. We have a lot more work to do. Since 2013, we've seen more fatalities from surf and rip currents than we have from wind and storm surge. Okay, so let's keep spreading the word about the rip currents. Don't be out there in, in the water when these systems don't surf, taking advantage of the big waves. Let's not do that because we're losing people every year. So help us spread the word on, on that as well. So remember, you always got to run from the water, hide from the wind. Impacts aren't just coastal, they occur well inland. So those in the media well inland, uh, please spread the word that you know, these tropical systems is not just a coastal thing. You, you get a lot of impacts inland. And look at the stats. You look back at certain hurricanes. I was thinking about it yesterday. We've had more direct fatalities during Hurricane Camille in Virginia than we did where the landfall was in Mississippi. That was a Category 5. It was that inland rain. So we look at even uh, more modern, direct, more direct fatalities during Hurricane Ida in New York City than we had in Louisiana where the direct impact was there. However, we had more indirect fatalities in Louisiana following the storm. 
right? The dangers aren't over once the hurricane passes, and that's something we need a, a lot more um, communication on as well. Look at Hurricane Florence, North Carolina, South Carolina, and I know, uh, Eric, you're familiar with, with that storm very close when you were in North Carolina. Um, you know, 100 miles inland, we had river flooding and heavy rainfall flooding where we lost lives hundreds of miles inland, okay? So hurricanes impact far beyond the coast. Be aware and prepared no matter where you live. The threat isn't over after the storm. I can't stress this, this enough. And we look since 2013, the direct fatalities in, from uh, these tropical systems direct were 455 from the rain, the storm surge, and the wind. Indirect fatalities during this same period of time, 418. You see what I'm saying? So think, take that in when you think about the dangers aren't over um, when the storm passes. And a lot of those fatalities are, are just clean up right, is going out too early, please listen to those local officials. They know what they're talking about, right? Listen to those local officials. And a big one, you look at Hurricane Laura, you think about a category, the category that we had there, we had an 18-foot storm surge in Louisiana. We lost more people from improper use of generators than we did storm surge. Please help us remind everybody to use generators correctly, outdoors, not indoors, away from open windows and that sort of thing, because we lose a lot of lives from these things. So that's a big one that, that we need to remember. Another one is, and I, and I know people have heard me say this before, you know what, these, these storms, they don't really care about your timelines. You know, we, we have a lot of timelines in this country on, on how we evacuate and how we get ready, and you look at statistics, and you look at rapid intensification, you look at some of these storms, um, these tracks have been remarkably accurate, right? If you look at our accuracy, it's been incredible. The intensity is catching up, and we've made some big strides in the last four or five years in intensity. In fact, you, you look at the last few years, Hurricane Center has made incredible accurate predictions from these rapid intensifying storms um, in advance. So not long ago, we didn't think that was possible, but we're doing it, right? It's the data going into it. It's the hurricane hunters, as Dr. Spinrad mentioned. It's, it's remarkable how far we've come. Since the year 2000, we've cut the track error by 64%, and we've cut the intensity error in half. It's not bad, right? A lot of investments go into that to, to make that happen. But here's what I really want you to remember. And I just took Category 5s. I, I could look at 4s. I can look at all the strongest storms. Every Category 5 storm that made landfall in, in the United States in the last 100 years, ready, is a tropical storm or less three days prior. The big ones are fast, right? And you look at a season like this where, you know, you can could, you could see um, some pretty strong storms with, with this forecast. In the last 100 years, every single one of these uh, big storms, Cat 5s, were a tropical storm or less three days prior, and several de didn't even exist three days prior. All right? That's why I'm saying time, they don't care about our timelines. Preparedness is absolutely everything. On those Category 5s, the average lead time was 50 hours. Preparedness got to be ready for these storms. We've got some new things I'm proud of. We've got a new cone. What do you think of that? It's a, it's a hot topic. Everybody likes to ask, right? So everybody's like, what, what about the cone? There's always questions about cones. So I'm, I'm proud to say we're, we're doing something about it. You can't, you can't just go wild with the cone because everybody does recognize it. So we're trying to improve it with, based on feedback. Remember, the cone itself is a cone of error. It's where we think the center of the storm is going to be two-thirds of the time. What about the other one-third? Outside the cone. Right? So it's a statistical analysis of where we think the, where the storm's going to be. So what we're trying to do here, and here's an example of it on the screen, it's a new cone. So you're going to still have the cone of uncertainty with a statistical analysis, but at the same time, we're also going to put our watches and warnings. We're going to put the impacts on the map. And this is a way that we can show everyone in the public and, and give everybody in the media a graphic to show to say, wow, there's sure a lot of impacts outside that cone, right? The graphic is so powerful because it means more than me saying, hey, there's impacts outside the cone. Okay, fine, but now you can see it, okay? So this is experimental. We're going to try it this year. Uh, I'm super excited about it. So you can see, look how big the impacts are and how many of those impacts are outside the cone. The other part of it is a Spanish language translation uh, using artificial intelligence, AI. You know, for, for decades we had people in, in Puerto Rico, San Juan, translating our, our tropical products into Spanish. Uh, now we've partnered with a company called Lilt, and we're actually using AI to be able to, to, be able to translate that right, right as we go, fast. That's important. And we have humans that get in there and correct it, and then the AI remembers that correction, and, and there you go. It's able to, to fix any errors that we have because there's a lot of dialects when you look at all the countries we serve across the globe. So I'm going to wrap it up. Got, got to be prepared is the big takeaway. And uh, 
hey, we're getting ready, how about you? Right? So let's get everybody ready for this hurricane season. We've been through some pretty tough seasons. We're going to get through this without a doubt. And uh, speaking of being ready, we uh, think about what FEMA does for a living and an incredible partnership that the Weather Service and NOAA has with our partners at FEMA. You think about federal agencies working together. We're, we're side by side all the time in, in what we do, and just to really appreciate that relationship. So I want to hand it off to my friend, FEMA Deputy Administrator Eric Hooks. Thank you, Ken. Thank you for our long-standing friendship and partnership. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Spinrad, for hosting us here for this important event. Uh, the relationships run deep, and they're very important to the American people. Again, I'm Eric Hooks. I'm the FEMA Deputy Administrator. Uh, Administrator Criswell is on the ground in Iowa today, surveying the damage uh, from the storms that took place a few nights ago. Uh, our thoughts and prayers are with those who lost loved ones, and we keep those communities in the Midwest in our thoughts as they begin their recovery. Concerning today's topics, as severe weather events, including hurricanes, continue to increase in frequency and duration, the collaboration between FEMA, NOAA, and the National Weather Service is more important than ever. I will also want to acknowledge the journalists and the media who are gathered here today for this critical work as you continue to amplify the life-saving, life-sustaining messaging that's needed across this nation, especially when we head into this year's hurricane season. Also, especially because with intensifying storms, we may have less time to warn communities. Time is of great value, and we need your help to leverage every minute to keep people safe. We're just over a week out from the 2024 Atlantic hurricane season, so we're getting down to the wire when it comes to ensuring communities are prepared for whatever lies ahead. So before hurricane season officially begins, my message to the American people is this. Take time to make sure that you have a clear understanding of your unique risk now. Do you have medication that requires refrigeration? Do you have a medical device that requires electricity? Do you have mobility challenges that make evacuations harder? Now is the time to ask yourself these questions. Understand your risks and put a plan in place so that you're prepared when disaster strikes. That's what resilience is all about. It's about anticipating risks taking steps to mitigate them, taking action, which in turn helps jumpstart a recovery after the emergency passes. And let me remind you that hurricanes and tropical storms aren't just for coastal communities. You heard Ken uh, have a tremendous expression uh, about how the impacts can go far beyond the, the actual impact of the storm. These storms, like Hurricane Ida and Hillary, can have significant impacts hundreds of miles inland. Ken and I also lived this through Hurricane Florence back in 2018 in a prior post that I had. Impacts far extend beyond coastal communities. So all of us, from the federal level, tribal nations, state, local communities, and at the individual level, need to start getting risk ready today to ensure that we're prepared for tomorrow. You might be wondering, what is FEMA doing to prepare for hurricane season? Well, I'll gladly tell you. Earlier this year, we opened a new distribution center in Greencastle, Pennsylvania, tripling our capacity and better positioning us to rapidly deploy along the mid-Atlantic and Northeast. Because as I said before, time is of great value in the response and recovery process. So this hurricane season, we're going to pre-position earlier than we ever have before to reach people even faster. We delivered hurricane readiness training to over 4,000 emergency managers throughout our, through our partnerships with NOAA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to ensure that we're in lockstep with our partners on the ground. We've made historic updates to the way individuals and families can receive our assistance to increase flexibility in our programs 
and jumpstart recovery more efficiently. And when working with communities to better understand their risks and be in the know when it comes to their evacuation plans, we want people to know where to go, what to bring, and where to get good and trusted information. Everyone here today and everyone listening in has a critical role to play, making sure our families, neighbors, and communities have what they need to stay safe this hurricane season. If you haven't done so already, I ask that you take some time over the next few days, really take some time right now, as soon as this conference is over, to think about what you need to do to protect yourself, your loved ones, and even your pets should a hurricane head your way this summer. Don't put it off. The time to act, the time to prepare is now. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Lori and thank you for having me today. Thank you, Deputy Administrator Hooks. Before we move on to the Q&A portion, I want to again thank and acknowledge Matt Rosencrantz, our lead hurricane seasonal outlook forecaster with NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. And note again that Matt is available to answer questions about the science behind the hurricane outlook. Um, we'll begin with questions uh, from reporters in the room.